You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 99 of the Common Descent Podcast. Wow. What a number. Whew. This you can't episode, get better than that. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I don't you know. I think we cut, we call it here. This episode, it, this is a long-awaited topic. Yeah, many people have pointed a finger and said it's been almost a hundred episodes. <laughs> I think somebody's. I don't remember where I saw this. Someone said, "I'm starting to think you're never going to do an insects episode." <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the list and I said, "You know what? We should get it in before triple digits." Yeah. yeah. This episode is about the evolution of insects. Now. Uh, often we will do evolution of episodes where we focus a little bit more on where they came from, how they came to be as they are today. What are some trends through their evolution? That is absolutely what we're doing here because we cannot do an episode on insects nope. as an episode. No. Nope. This episode is basically going to give us the background so that later if people want us to do specific insect groups we can do specific insect groups yeah. well it's kind of like when we did dinosauria yeah where it's he, here's the category right same thing with birds yeah we did evolution of birds and now we can do more birds if you want us to do specific <laughs> yes. birds you you ask for wasps and and hawks later on and we'll do yeah. those insects are unbelievably diverse their evolutionary history goes back incredibly far there is so much to talk about in the story of the evolution of insects. We are going to keep it relatively simple and brief. <laughs> we're going to talk about what insects are. We're going to talk about where they come from. And we're going to highlight some of the big evolutionary patterns, big evolutionary steps in the history of insects on Earth. Basically get a, a general sense of how did insects come to be as we know them today? How did they come to rule the world? Yes, exactly. <laughs> like when you were talking about how diverse they are, insects are so diverse that that's like the thing they're known for. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get into that late. Like insects are very diverse is an extreme understatement. Yeah. It's like, like that's, <laughs> insects are insects. Yes. <laughs> On a scale from one to insects <laughs> in diversity. This episode was requested by a number of people. Patrons. Clara, Francis, Mabel, and Tobias. And this topic also partially fulfills, <laughs> uh, it will include fulfillment of requests from another patron, Lorenz, as well as Teodora and Jonathan. Thanks for the requests, everyone. Thanks for bringing those in. We appreciate it as always. Before we get into the episode, a few quick announcements. Number one, we have a Patreon. We sure do. And on Patreon, you get all sorts of goodies for joining us and supporting us on Patreon. And one of the things we like to do is shout out the names of patrons at a certain level or higher. And boy, have we been getting a lot of patrons lately. Yeah, for real. We so appreciate all of our new patrons. They've been rolling in, especially this is a wacky year. And we appreciate all that support. It's been amazing. Specifically this episode, we would like to shout out Ben, Mike, Michael, Sean, and Stacy. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks so much. This, it's really incredible. A couple other things related to other projects in the works. Number one, it's November. Yeah. Which means, first of all, that October just ended. It sure did. And Spook E 2020 has come to a close. We released four episodes in Spookulative Evolution this year on Sea Monsters. Yes. So if you haven't already, give it a listen. If you have listened, let us know what you thought of this year's Spook E. Yeah, we love hearing your ideas in regards to the creatures we create, because we can only speculate so long and so much of them. So when you have extra ideas for behaviors and features, we love hearing them. So much fun. So much fun. And of course, we will be back next year for more spooky. November also means it's time to start thinking about the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Specifically, we have a tradition where we do the end of the year Q&A. Yes, we do. So a couple weeks from the uh, uh, release of this episode... We're going to put out the Google form on social media in our episode description for you, all of you, to submit questions for us to answer in our big Q&A episode at the end of 2020. 
Yeah, it's always a lot of fun. Gives everyone a chance to ask specific questions that we haven't answered or sometimes random questions that are just fun to answer. (laughs) And it's always great. So we'll announce that again next episode. Keep your eyes out. The form will probably be up for about a month and then it'll go down as we prepare to release it by the turn of the year. Finally, it's episode 99. Yup. Which means next episode is episode 100. Yeah. Now, it's two things. Number one, it's just a number. It doesn't mean anything. No, it's just one more than this one. Number two, it's awesome. It's three digits (laughs) and it's 100. Three whole digits. Yeah. Our episode names are going to start taking up slightly more space. Yes. We have a few things in mind for episode 100. Nothing overly extravagant. First and foremost, we've got tons of requests for topics that would be suitable for episode 100. We have chosen one out of the many requests that we got. Uh, it's going to be a normal episode, normal format, standard setup, but we think we, we're we excited that we have chosen a suitably grandiose yeah. subject for the episode, so keep your ears out for that. Also, we're planning to do a little bonus uh, recording of a 100-episode retrospective. Yeah, a little look back on... How- what, how the podcast has gotten to where it is. Yeah, so it'll just be us chatting, looking back over what we've done. So if you're into the sort of behind the scenes, hearing about us and our experience and our process, uh, keep an ear out for that. So I think it's something you might enjoy. And finally, we are planning to do a Patreon live stream. Yes. To celebrate episode 100. So patrons, keep your ears, eyes, etc. Uh, out on your notifications. We will be posting information about that on Patreon, and it should be a cool opportunity for us to interact with some of our patrons. Yeah, have a chat. So there's, uh, we're wrapping up some cool stuff. We've got some cool stuff coming up soon. We're real excited about it. And then, of course, uh, uh, just a couple of more regional-specific notes. It's the beginning of November as this episode comes out, so if you're listening to this early, go vote! Yeah! If you're here in the U.S., it's an important election. It's a time to make your voice heard We early voted. If you're voting on election day, make a plan. Stay safe. Yes. And that goes for everybody. Uh, Keep yourselves safe and healthy out there. Uh, As of right now, our numbers of cases are going up again here in the U.S. Uh, So we hope everyone is doing okay physically and emotionally in this, the year of 20. The the year that will not be named. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And with that, I think it is time to move on to our next section, our traditional section, our rambly segue into the news. The news! Every episode, before we get to our main topic, we like to pick some news from paleontology, evolution, etc., etc., to explore what's going on out there in science. Yeah! Will? I have news on a small, weird pterosaur. Ooh, I like all three of those things. Right? Yeah. How can you go wrong? Yeah, this is about a new species of pterosaur that has features that currently are unknown in any other pterosaur, significantly so. Oh, interesting. That suggests a different kind of lifestyle that we have yet to see in pterosaurs. Nice. So we talked about pterosaurs in episode 79, Mm -hmm. and they are the very diverse flying reptiles of the Mesozoic. So the fact that there is more added to this diversity is intriguing. Yeah. This is research by Roy Smith et al. in Cretaceous Research, and the press release is by a University of Portsmouth in phys.org. So this new species of pterosaur is Leptosomia begaiensis, which when they say small, they mean about the size of a turkey. So it is fairly small and is unique. Also a November Yes, tradition. there we go. The, <laughs> Very fitting. The, the roasted pterosaur. <laughs> This one is unique for having a long, slender, toothless beak. Okay. Like, very slender, as in like sandpiper or kiwi slender beak. Oh, interesting. So, when they found this, they first found just a piece of beak, and it was so weird, they thought it was a fish spine. (sighs) That's how slender we're talking. (laughs) Wow. And it wasn't until they took a closer look and saw specific textures on the bone that are unique or or identified uh, that are only seen in pterosaurs that they realized they were dealing with part of a pterosaur. As they they looked more at the fossil site, which are the Kim Kim 
strata in Morocco, a Cretaceous fossil site, they were able to find more of the animal and get a better view of this small, weird pterosaur. So this long, skinny beak, like I said, is very similar to sandpipers and kiwis, the long, skinny beaked birds that we have today. And they think it was likely using it in a similar probing way to like go into the sand or go into the dirt looking for worms or little shrimp or something. They don't know where it was hunting, but the beak has a very similar shape. And they took a closer look with some CT scans and were able to reveal networks of internal canals that seem to be for nerves along the beak that would have made it very good at detecting things like prey in the dirt or sand. Uh, so poking its face in there, not only to grab things, but to search for things. Yeah, so that, like it actually would have been able to detect what was down there. Cool. And this is all very interesting because we've never seen a pterosaur, A, with a beak this long and skinny, or one that seemed like it was feeding like a sandpiper or other probing bird. And as they point out, It was misidentified at first, so this could be much more common among pterosaurs, and we've just not been recognizing it. A lot of fish spines out there. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so they bring up that this could, you know, key us into noticing similar structures or similar beak pterosaurs in other places or that have already been found. Man, pterosaurs just don't ever stop being weird. Right? They're so just the diverse and it makes sense right we've talked about this yes. like flight tends to do that to a group of animals like birds did a very similar thing yes all over the planet all sorts of different niches and 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 ecologies and lifestyles so it's not ever surprising to find that pterosaurs have done yet another thing that birds have done yes or I uh, reverse that. And that they actually, birds, birds have done yet yeah, another thing that pterosaurs They make that point in the article where they say that lots of people may look at this and be like, wow, it's, it's you know, mimicking a behavior that we see in birds. And the truth is, nope, birds are copying a behavior that this pterosaur evolved yeah. before they ever <laughs> were able to develop these feeding styles. So it's not surprising, but it's always so much fun. It's I love it so much. Like somewhere there is a theoretical list of all the things that birds do. Mm-hmm. And we're just slowly checking them off. It's like, yep, pterosaurs do that. They do that. They do that. Yep. Filter feeding like flamingos. Check. Uh, probing sand like sandpipers. Yep. Check. Yep. It's going down the list. More in episode 79. Well, it's it's great because flight is a very successful you know strategy. For survival. You You don't say. Yeah, yeah. I I wonder if we'll find out that helped out another group. I wonder if we'll mention that once or twice or a hundred times this episode. (laughs) A few billion times. So flight's super successful, but also they were a successful flying group. Like, it wasn't just that, you know, and they also discovered flights. No, they were the dominant flying group for a long time. All over the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, of course they found a niche, a way to fit into every niche because ample chances and ample time, which is, they're so awesome. Very cool. Well, hey, keeping with the theme of flying things, my first bit of news is about new discoveries of bony-toothed birds. Ooh. Yeah, so we've talked about these in episode 37.5. We talked about pelagornithids briefly, which are these birds that had these long beaks with bony projections sticking out of the jaw that... Pseudo-teeth. Weren't teeth. Yep, the <laughs> pseudo-toothed birds. Which is so cool. We ta- Episode 88, we talked about what makes a tooth a tooth. Mm-hmm. The, the tissues inside a tooth. These don't have that. They're just bony spikes. Yeah, it's just beak taking the shape of, of tooth. This is research in scientific reports by Peter Close, Ashley Poust, and Tom Stidham. And we'll link to an article in Smithsonian Magazine by Riley Black, who describes the, the pelagornithids as, quote, and I, if I remember right, this is the first line of the article. <laughs> Imagine an albatross with a hacksaw for a mouth. <laughs> Accurate. Because Riley's great. <laughs> <laughs> These were often large... Uh, seabirds, right? albatross is a good comparison, which were around from the early Cenozoic, right, 56 million years ago, 
to the late Pliocene, about two million years ago. Yeah. They were around for a real long time. They were all over the world. Most of them are large. So around with estimate, estimated wingspans around four meters or, you know, 13, 14 feet. Yeah, so a big bird. And some were larger. In fact, this group includes some of the largest flying birds ever, which is what we talked about in episode 37.5. In this new research, the authors, the first thing they do is they identify a new specimen from Antarctica. Oh. From Seymour Island. So apparently, this brings the total number of pelagornithid pseudotoothed bird specimens from Antarctica to six. The others include jaw fragments, leg fragments. Uh, There are multiple specimens that seem to belong to different species of different sizes. This new one is a fragment of the dentary, so the lower jaw. It is over 12 centimeters long, so several inches. Decent. From the Middle Eocene, somewhere around, you know, 40 million years old or so. Comparing this lower jaw fragment to other pseudotoothed birds the authors estimate that its size would be on par with the largest pseudotoothed birds. Wow. So we're looking at an animal with a wingspan of 5 to 6 meters, or up in the range of 20 feet. Yeah. These are tied up there alongside, right, the other giant pelagornithids and the giant pteratorn, Argentavis. Yes. Uh, which is very condor-like. The other bone they analyze... In this study is a tarsometatarsus fragment, which is a lower leg bone, from another pseudotoothed bird, which was already known, and is the largest of this bone known from these birds. So another giant among the pseudotoothed birds. This one was previously thought to have come from the same rock formation as that jaw fragment, so it would have been around 40 million years old. But here, they take a closer look at its associations and reassign it to the slightly older rock layer underneath that, uh, the rock formation, which is about 50 million years old. Okay. Which means that it is the earliest giant pseudotooth bird. Oh. This tells us a couple things. Number one, that this group of birds, which only showed up, you know, five or six million years before that, very quickly achieved giant sizes. Yes. And that they were giant in Antarctica for over 10 million years. That th- this is a group that it wasn't like they were giant for a little. Yeah. Like or one of them got big and and that was it. Right. No, th- giant hacksaw face birds were a staple in Antarctica for at least several million years, which is impressive. And the authors describe that this uh, speaks to their prolonged survival in the southern seas as pelagic predators, right? right? Open ocean along in the open and along the coast, alongside other birds like early penguins. Oh, yeah. Uh, These were some of the dominant coastal marine southern birds. That's awesome. You know that they were eating early baby penguins of course (laughs) i mean i would (laughs) right (laughs) i i like this research because sometimes when dates get shifted it can seem kind of underwhelming if it's not something you're studying you know if it's it's like all right so it was this old not that old Uh, unless it's like around an extinction boundary you know it's they actually survived the extinction instead of showing up after you know unless it's something obvious like that a lot of times it's just like all right Noted. It's a little bit older than we thought it was. I like this one because it's a good example of why noting date extensions and date changes can be so important. Is now it tells us that not only did big uh, the big pseudotooth birds show up early in their history, but they were successful in this area for a while. Yeah, like it it does change the picture because now we are changing the timeline of this group, not just this one individual right it can be it it, it can be a little bit underwhelming when it's like we have this one type of this animal and it's actually two million years over here yeah but once we start getting more of them and we start getting an idea of the group as a whole and their global community those dates and times become much more important well it's it's like finding out you know when your ancestors reached a country yeah you know did they come in 
before or after a war. That's very different story sort of thing. Like it starts changing the overall story of the group. And that's awesome. That's really cool. It's one of the, it, it is the strength of paleontology that as much fun as it is to go, hey, we found this one dinosaur and it's cool. It is a whole different level of inference to be able to say we are studying this extinct group of animals and what they were doing, where they were doing it and when. And it's a really, it's a, it's the kind of thing you don't get really outside of paleontology. No, because it's, it is all hindsight. And so we're able to take a broad look yeah. at things you just can't do when you're only dealing with the ones alive in front of you. <laughs> Neat. Well, my next bit of news is also about things in the air. The whole episode. These are dinosaurs, but not birds, and they weren't flyers. According to this, they may not have been even very good gliders. Okay, so we're kind of in the air. Kind of in the air, or hesitantly in the air. (laughs) (laughs) This is about Yichi and Ambopteryx, the bat-winged dinosaurs. Right, the ones that were feathery, but also had sort Mm -hmm. of flap, leathery, Yeah, membrane, extended finger wings. Yeah. Because that's awesome. This is researched by Alexander Dekechi et al. in iScience, and the press releases by Cell Press in Phys.org again. So, Yichi and Embompteryx, Lake Jurassic, Chinese dinosaurs, about 160 million years old. These are the bat-winged dinosaurs that it has been questioned what their actual flying ability was. Right. This is around the same time we're seeing the earliest true birds. Yes. Like, dinosaurs are doing a lot of experimenting around this time with going into the skies. And so this research was taking a closer look at fossils of these dinosaurs using the laser stimulated fluorescence, which scans the surrounding sediment for signs of soft tissue. They were able to then use their findings to model the flight capabilities of these dinosaurs by analyzing things like weight, wingspan, muscle placement, and then apply mathematical formulas to these and say, would these be able to fly based on what we can tell? Cool. Right? Once again, sci-fi paleontology. Welcome to the future. This is how Tony Stark would study paleontology. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It's pretty awesome. And what they found is they are likely not flyers. Okay. Uh, Not that they for sure couldn't fly, but as they put it, you would have to make them the lightest weight of the estimates, have them flap as fast as really fast flapping birds, and give them muscles higher than is expected that they had. And then maybe they could have flown. Okay. So, so they, they would have had to be pushing the boundaries. In every category. Yeah. Flapping really fast with tons of muscle and very lightweight. And then they would have potentially been able to cross, as they put, the flight threshold. Okay. Hmm. So it's not likely. Right. They don't seem like they're flyers. They are not They are not built to where they're in a flying Goldilocks zone of any sort. They're on the edges. So more likely, they were gliders. But even then, they don't seem like they were probably very efficient <laughs> gliders. So, <laughs> but just kicking these, these yeah. dinosaurs while they're down. Yeah, and they, they make the point that these dinosaurs were only around for a few million years. Mm. And they they suspect after these findings that they were just outcompeted by the other flying groups that were showing up. And just, you, if you could fly, you weren't good at it. And if you were gliding, you weren't an amazing glider. And you just, they did this, this experiment into winged dinosaurs just did not, Take off. Ta- uh, ah, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here all week. Well, I, and I guess that kind of explains maybe, potentially, right? We don't want to jump too too many conclusions. But that could be a part of the explanation as to why we don't see a lot of bat-winged dinosaurs. Oh, uh, yeah, you gave it a shot and it wasn't the winning combination. Yeah, that lineage just kind of petered out. As they put, squeezed out of the niche of winged bird mm-hmm. or winged dinosaur. And so, because when I first was reading the article, they put that, idea up front and my immediate thought was like oh well, we have lots of gliding things that do fine but then as it kept going it's like oh, okay yeah they're not they just don't sound like they were very efficient at any aspect of being a winged dinosaur so they just didn't they weren't particularly successful 
I think that it's it's really interesting not only to be able to get a, a glimpse, if that is in fact what we're seeing, yes. of a short-lived experiment that didn't quite become the norm, that didn't quite diversify later, but also this is a great display of what we like to talk about, that when you get a new evolutionary innovation, it rarely just happens. Yeah. There's usually lots of relatives doing similar things. And that's a really cool demonstration of, yeah, no, there were a few different groups that were doing similar things before the version we have come to know became the standard. Yes. It's like at that point, you during their time, you could have looked around and without future knowledge, it would have been anybody's guess. Right. You know, you could have been like, what's well, I you all seem like fair runners in this race to me. But now it's like, well, yeah, of course it didn't pan out. Right. Because we live in a world dominated by small feathered dinosaurs. Right. All those stegosaurs and brachiosaurs could have been taken bets. Yes, exactly. Which one of these are going to make it? <laughs> exactly. Uh, joke was on them. They didn't find out. Nope. No, nope. They didn't make it. Irony. Well, my final bit of news for this episode is not about a flying thing. Ah. Uh... I'm, ta- I- I- I'm taking a little break. It is about dinosaurs. Okay. And I'm. this is research by Phil Bell et al. in BioArchive. We will link to another article by Riley Black, this one in Slate, and I will tease it by just reading Riley's headline, We Finally Know What a Dinosaur's Butthole Looks Like. All right, you have my attention. (laughs) Psittacosaurus is an early ceratopsian from uh, China, the early Cretaceous. Uh, We talked about those in episode 87. Yes, we did. Uh, So early cousins of Triceratops, uh, etc. So these were small, you know, pig-sized-ish, maybe, dinosaurs that were at least sometimes bipedal. They had little horns on their cheeks, a little beak. Cool little dinosaurs. Notable for being known from lots of specimens. Psittacosaurus is is very well known. And a few exceptional specimens that include remains of things like soft tissue. This study looked at one of those specimens that preserves skin and scales, the bristles on the tail. Yes. I think, actually I didn't check this, uh, this might be the same specimen that was used as the basis for the the study that analyzed the coloration pattern over the body. Yeah, the, the countershading. The, the countershading and all that. That led to the, the that awesome sculpture. Yes. That possibly the most lifelike dinosaur sculpture we've ever had. Psittacosaurus. Well, while analyzing this specimen, they noticed a dark mottled area beneath the tail. Shame on them for looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> Which, when they took a closer look, appears to be a well-preserved cloaca. Wow. Now, this is a big deal. Very big deal. Because we've never looked at a dinosaur's cloaca before outside of birds. And that's that tells us a lot about dinosaurs, is what th- what was happening on the back end. Yes. So, cloacas. Uh, uh, lots of animals today have cloacas. A cloaca is a catch-all back-end orifice. A multi-purpose orifice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is where they're doing reproduction. It is where they are excreting. So they're peeing, they're pooping, and they're uh, making babies. Yep. All using the same body exit. Birds have them, crocs have them, squamates have them, uh, monotremes have them, because they're just the weirdest mammals. Yep. And more. But cloacas are different in different groups. Ooh, see, this is where my knowledge of cloacas ends. So, for example, in lizards, the cloaca, the vent, right, the opening, is a vertical gap. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In crocs, it's a horizontal gap. True. It's, yeah, it's in line with the scales. Yeah. Yeah. And in birds, it tends to be round or square-shaped. Oh, right. So one big question, right? It's not a surprise to find a cloaca on a non-bird dinosaur. Birds have them, crocs have them. It would have been kind of weird. Right. If just suddenly a mammalian, you know, butt showed up. Right. Like, this makes sense. No, that that fits with who all of your cousins are. But But the opening question has been, whose cloaca is it going to be like? Yeah, what's the opening? And taking a close look, they were able to document the features of it, and it's croc-like. Weird! It is a horizontal opening, surrounded, as they described it, by a rosette of scales. Oh! Like we see in crocs. Yes! Which seems to suggest that the bird cloaca is a 
like so many things, a bird line thing. Yes. Now, to be fair, Psittacosaurus is on the other side of the dinosaur family tree. Absolutely. If we were to get a T-Rex cloaca, it right. might be much more bird-like. Right. But at least these dinosaurs, at least Psittacosaurus and maybe Ceratopsians in mm-hmm. general, maybe Ornithischians in general, have a very croc-like cloaca, which suggests that non-bird-line dinosaurs, or at least some of them, may also have had croc-like genitals. Oh, good point. So, uh, as the authors describe, this leads them to estimate that these dinosaurs may have had a muscular, unpaired, ventrally positioned, copulatory organ. Yep. So, this is as opposed to lizards and snakes, who tend to have paired hemipenes yep. that come out of the cloaca, and birds who tend not to have a copulatory organ. Yes. Right. Most birds don't have a penis or anything penis-like. Yeah, they don't have that kind of structure. Right. Some of them do, but most most tend not to. And if that's true, then that would suggest that these dinosaurs were also internally fertilizing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which makes sense. Doesn't answer a whole lot of our questions about how they were doing that. Oh, yeah. How were they positioning? <laughs> well, it's, I love that it's like they may have had sexual organs similar to crocodiles who have sex exclusively in the water. Right. <laughs> That's it. All dinosaurs, we, we, have, we haven't we have solved anything. That's not entirely true, though, because they were able to uh, not only ascertain what style of cloaca they have, but also a few details. For example, where it's positioned in relation to the hips and the tail, right? A little bit farther back than we see, for example, in lizards and snakes relative to the tail. Cool. Uh, which might actually help uh, us continue to understand how they were copulating. Yes. They were also able to identify, based on the development of the cloaca, or as Riley puts it, the butthole, <laughs> that this is likely a near sexually mature subadult. So almost a mature adult. Interesting. I, I didn't even think about that in fir- like oh. telling us that. Because, yeah. Uh, things that are related to sexual reproduction and perhaps just cloacas in general Mm -hmm. change as you grow. And from that, you might then be inclined to ask, did it tell them anything about the sex of the dinosaur? That does seem to be the the obvious next question. Which is another like holy grail of can we find evidence to tell us male versus female dinosaurs? And the answer is no. Because in part... The organs are internal. Yes. Like lizards, like crocs, like birds. So, yeah. <laughs> we have not... <laughs> the outside of the pocket. We don't know what's in it. Right. In mammals, this would have been great. Yes. <laughs> External uh, organs back there, that'll tell you what you're dealing with. Uh, except for monotremes, which are weird, I guess. But but with cloacas, yeah. There's a reason that when you're sexing a croc or snake, you have to probe. Yeah, exactly. Cause... You can't do it when they're young because it's too tiny. <laughs> And yeah. everything's hidden inside. Yeah. So unless they show you, you don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> unless you convince them. Yeah. No, it's, that happened with one of our baby gators. Is one of the one of our handlers came back and went, "Hey, so I can't remember who it was, but hey, so that one is a boy. Like is a male. <laughs> I mean, it is male because uh, they uh, demonstrated. Uh, so that it, it presumably is how you'd have to sex a dinosaur. Yes. You have to get your T Rex. It's not. It's not as simple. As Ian Malcolm positive, <laughs> yes, his... as lifting up all the dinosaur yep. skirts. Yep, I've yeah. been I've been looking for where to put that <laughs> quote. You gotta this whole you gotta time. go a step further. You gotta get a little more intrusive. <laughs> That's so. Once again, we are living in the future. It's sci-fi paleontology. It's amazing that we can even know that they have a cloaca. Yeah, and then the fact that it's so well detailed that we can get the shape of it and other information yep. all the scales they, yes. they, they mentioned the wrinkled pattern of the the skin around it that's it. have fun paleo artists uh enjoy it's this is another thing on the long list of had you asked me will we ever know i'd be like no probably not right i'm sorry we just won't ever find that and no. here i am very wrong and happy about it <laughs> Yeah, turns out those buttholes aren't out of reach. Yes, not as not as mysterious as we once thought. Yeah. What a world we live in, everyone. Maybe someday we'll do an episode about buttholes. <laughs> but it is not this episode. 
<laughs> this episode is about the evolution of insects. And now that the news is done, we can go back to the air and talk about insects. Woo! After this break. Will, what are your favorite insects? Pick a group. Oh, a group. Like, I, what would you, what would you say your favorite type of insect is? If I was forced to pick a single group, ants. Cool. Good choice. Ants are probably my favorite. Ants are a good choice because people are generally familiar with ants and they will help us understand what an insect is. Right. Dear listeners, think of an ant. Picture it in your mind. Yes, yes. <laughs> Insects, like this ant, are arthropods, mm -hmm. right? That These are animals with hard exoskeletons that are made out of plates called sclerites. Uh, and in insects, there's a lot of talk about sclerites and what they end up doing at different parts of the body. Neat. Arthropods have segmented bodies and jointed appendages. Yes. Insects, like our ant, have three sections of the body. The head, the thorax, and the abdomen each of which has specialized roles. So the head of an insect tends to be up in the front, has antennae for sensing the world, has mouth parts for eating and manipulating things. Uh, insects typically have compound eyes yep. up on the head. The head's job is to sense the world, to take in food, and as uh, my main source uh, described, neural command. Yeah. Which is to say that's where their equivalent of a brain is. And I love that you use the word equivalent, because... Yep, yep, it's not quite... Yep. insects. <laughs> section number two, the middle section, is the thorax, which is composed of three segments. Each segment has a pair of legs attached to it. Yep. Six legs, which are the reason insects are part of the group called hexapods. Yeah. Also on the thorax, in most insects, there are wings. Most insects have two pairs of wings... Although that's not always the case. There are some insects with fewer. There are some insects where the wings are an unusual shape. And there are some insects that have just lost their wings completely. Mm -hmm. Insect wings are unusual compared to our familiar bird bat pterosaur wings. Because whereas, you know, a bird's wing is basically an arm. Yep. Like yours. And there's musculature all up and down it. And it can control the shape and the movement yeah, can all throughout. Fold, it can flex. Insect wings, the musculature is only at the base, and it only controls the flapping and sort of orientation of the wing. It's basically an oar. Yeah, they can move it, they can twist it, they can angle it, but the wing itself does not have any muscles in it. Which means that all that really important work of changing the shape of the wing as it flies... Right, airplanes do this, that they have yes. those flaps on the wing, because the wing shape is a huge influence on how it interacts with the air, how it produces lift and thrust. All that in insect wings happens passively. Their wings have planes of weakness that fold when they move through the air in just the way that they need to produce the lift and thrust they need to move through the air. It's like when... Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> it, it's, it's like those um, 3D printed materials to where it's like, the way it is printed and constructed means it does what it needs to do just by the geometry of its shapes. Right. All the insect has to do is flap and angle the wings, and the wing is doing the rest of the aerodynamics job, which is really, really super cool. It gets even crazier with the ones that, like, can fold their wings up like origami. Yes. It's just, what? Yep. So the thorax, legs, wings, the thorax's job is locomotion. That's the predominant, that is the part the insect is using to move around. Getting from A to B. Which is how I always, as a kid, used to draw insects wrong. I remember <laughs> when I realized this at one point, that I was putting the legs all across the body. Yes. Yep, they're all in the thorax, the middle section. There's a great post, I've seen it on Facebook, that is rating all of the ant emojis. Yes. Across yes, various I've platforms. That. And that's one of the things they complain about, is when they spread the legs out. And they're <laughs> like, one of them was just, this is a termite. <laughs> And then finally, the third section is the abdomen, which has many, many segments and includes the organs. Mm -hmm. So this is where you've got your digestive organs, your excretion uh, uh, operations. Uh, this is where a lot of the breathing is taking place. This is where the rep reproductive organs are. 
At the back of most insects, there is room for an ovipositor, which is what they use to lay their eggs. And indeed, insects lay eggs yep. as a general rule. And I'm always going to say as a general rule, mostly from here on, because I am not willing to say all insects do X because I I know I'm wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere there's an insect that does something different. Just to spite you. This ant in our brain, right, has an abdomen. It would lay eggs, hatch from an ant, and then grow up through various stages of metamorphosis. This is the general body plan and setup for insects. Mm-hmm. Now, take that body plan and imagine thinking up as many variations as you possibly can and then ask 20 other people to also think up as many variations as they possibly can and then multiply your list by like 20 and you've about got insect diversity. Yep. Insects are synonymous with diversity. It's They are scary diverse. It's incredible. Blows everything else out of the competition. Insects are astounding in their numbers. For comparison, for some numbers, among vertebrates in living species, there are about 6,000 described species of mammals, about 10,000 birds, about 10,000 reptiles. There are almost 30,000 living species of fish, which is a lot, for a grand total of more than 60,000 Living species of vertebrates. Pretty good. Insects. Now, numbers vary depending on where you're looking. Mm -hmm. So my numbers I am pulling from Stork 2018. So your mileage may vary a little bit here or there. But according to this list, there are over a million identified species of insects. So a bit. No one seems to be under the illusion that we have identified all the insect species. <laughs> no. So people have attempted to estimate what the total number might be, and estimates tend to come in at th things like 5 million. <laughs> there are tons of groups within insects, right? Roaches, termites, uh, grasshoppers, etc., etc. Most of those groups have thousands of named species. There are as many species of dragonfly as there are mammals, yeah. Known in the world. Yeah. And then there are the big four. <laughs> the big four super groups within insects, which make up not only most of insects, but most of animals. Yep. The big four groups are, and again, these numbers are from this particular paper. Uh, your mileage may vary, but I'm going to use these to give you an idea. Hymenoptera. Woo! Which are your wasps, ants, and bees, and cousins coming in at around 117,000 species. <laughs> Diptera, which are flies. Yeah. Mosquitoes, midges, gnats, I believe, are in there. Yeah. All those two-winged insects. They've reduced one pair of their wings. Coming in at about 155,000 species, according to Stork 2018. Number three, Lepidoptera. Butterflies and moths. Yep. Coming in at, by these numbers, 157,000. And then finally, and um, anyone... I've been waiting for it. <laughs> and anyone who knows insects will, will have been waiting. Coleoptera beetles. Your beetles. Beetles. At, by this list, 386,000 named species so far. When I took a, a insect class in college... And we got to beetles. I vividly remember how stressed my professor was. <laughs> and and he said, like, this is one of my least favorite parts of this course. Because I there's no way I can do any remote amount of justice yep. to beetles during this couple of days. Yep. And we are not even going to come close in this episode. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, beetle fans. Yeah, he's like, this could be an entire course by itself. And then still we would not be doing well. <laughs> My main source of information for the uh, this episode was a book called Evolution of the Insects by David Grimaldi and Michael Engel. Fitting book. Real, real handy to have on my shelf, <laughs> <laughs> along with some supplements. Uh, so I'll be referencing this book a lot. There is a line somewhere in that book that says, roughly one in every four animals is a beetle. Now, those numbers are subject to change. Like I said, there are estimates for how many more we might find, and indeed... Um, I read, I think it was in that book as well, 
that some have estimated that if we were able to identify all of the species, Hymenoptera might actually be the number one. Really? Because of how many cryptic species and small species and parasitoid species there are. Yeah. So there, there's some, you know, there's some estimates out there that, that say that we're missing a lot of that info. Interesting. But at least for now, beetles are just insanely diverse and insects in general are famously, and again, I'll quote out of the book, the most diverse animals in the history of life. Yeah. Which it it is difficult to... Normally we start episodes like this and we go, let's get a sense of modern diversity. And I don't know how to do that in five minutes. Like, name an ecosystem, name a habitat, name a part of the world, name an, an ecological role insects are in it well it's when we were listing the numbers of species for the you know various animal groups and we got to over a million known species of insects you know based on that counting it it made me want to find my old children's book of how big a million is right like this is not oh wow it beat the others no no it is in a different category of magnitude right than the like the others we were counting in hundreds of thousands. This is over a million, potentially millions right. species of insects. You could take all the known species of birds and reptiles, count them up, and subtract that number from the number of known species of insects, and it's still over a million. Exactly. Like, this diversity is on a scale we've never tried to tackle, and it's incredibly daunting <laughs> they are in they are on every continent mm -hmm. they are on just about every landmass probably every landmass on the planet including all the little islands uh they are not ocean animals no that's the one the, aspect the one place where they're really you don't find there are insects in the ocean there are sea striders oh, yeah. uh, uh, there are marine parasites mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will infect uh, marine animals so there are some there Ecologically, insects do just about everything. There are predators, mm -hmm. like praying mantises, like dragonflies. There are tons of herbivores. In fact, between butterflies and beetles, you're looking at the most significant herbivores on the planet. Not to mention, you know, the true bug group, which includes piercing and sucking mouthparts. Yeah, that, that are, are drinking the plants. Specialized for that feeding pattern. They are major pollinators. Uh, especially within the big four. You've got detritivores like roaches and flies. You've got dedicated parasites like lice and fleas. You've got parasitoids like all the wasps that do it. Insects do just about all the things. Instead of trying to go through and list all the things, I was I want to just, hey, Will, yeah. what's what's one of your favorite things that insects do? I've always been amazed by the, like, crazy ways they reshape their limbs. Like, speaking of, like, the roles they do, in that you have the typical, like, walking legs, but then praying mantises have taken their front two limbs and turned them into murder weapons. Yeah, dragonflies also have spiny legs yeah. that project forward for catching things. A lot of, uh, a lot of your dung beetles have these, like, shovel-like structures on the side of their front pair of legs to shovel poo. And make it into the balls. And it's like, they've... And it's other animals have done this. Mammals have done this. But, like, insects have taken their limbs and just... It's like the interchangeable toys where you can switch out yeah. different kinds of arms. That's what they feel like to me. Uh, and speaking of adjusting body shape, one of the things that impresses me the most is their penchant for mimicry. Yes! Like, there are insects that look, obviously, like plants. I mean... Stick insects All and over. leaf insects are us incredible mimics, possibly like, the best mimics, certainly on land. Mm -hmm. I don't want to step on any yes. any yeah. of octopuses' eight <laughs> yes, arms. Yes. I don't want to offend the <laughs> cephalopods. I don't want to anger them. But but not only that, they also mimic each other. Yes. Like how many things that look like ants but are not ants are there? Mm -hmm. And how many ants are there that look like things that aren't ants? Yeah. Like, tons of this imitation in their body shape and when, and the thing that impresses me with it is how many like leaf mimicking insects there are in tons of groups it's not just like the leaf insects 
you know, figured it out. It's like, nope, leaf insects, there's butterflies that do it. Yeah, there's, there's moths that Katie do it. Dids. Katie dids. There's the little, like, springtails that look like, you know, buds and stuff and thorns. Like, you get all these different groups that all are mimicking plants ridiculously well. Yeah. It's not just one group that figured it out. It's just an insect thing. There are also all sorts of different variations in insect social behavior. Yes. This is getting into why ants were my favorite. Yeah. Some insects are solitary. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some that are gregarious. They'll kind of hang out together. They'll, yeah. they'll take safety in numbers. There are communal insects that will actually work together, right? Care for nests together, things like that. And then, of course, there are several groups yep. of eusocial insects. Which are insects that live in colonies where multiple generations are taking care of the nest and the queen, where you've got workers as opposed to, to the queen who's reproducing. Where they are working in such close concert and cooperation that they are often described as super organisms. Yes. Where the ant hill or beehive or wasp nest is not acting like a bunch of individuals though it is it is acting like one big organism made out of thousands of small bodies right which is the best thing ever (laughs) it's just they are so immensely diverse and successful we could go on forever well it's real quick one of my favorite things about the youth social thing is that it's so sci-fi that when yeah. sci-fi things represent it, they always represent that it's like, oh, the queen's controlling everyone, which isn't how it works. It's even more complex where they are deciding things by committee in this incredibly complex. So it's so alien and bizarre that when we show aliens doing it, we simplify it. Yeah. And, <laughs> I and, love it. And they've used those colonies to create not only some of the biggest insect communities, but also farming insects. Yep. So needless to say insects are extremely diverse so so diverse more so than just about any other certainly any other animals on the planet as far as we've identified them Mm -hmm. i'm sure there are some marine invertebrate people who are like just you wait oh we're gonna add all the crustaceans but absolutely dominant across the planet when we look at the fossil record we run into a couple of interesting problems when it comes to studying the fossil record of insects there is a bit of a almost paradoxical scenario with insects Mm -hmm. because insects are typically very small. They tend to be pretty delicate, even though they're covered in exoskeleton. They're easy to smush. It's what having armored skin doesn't mean it's not brittle armor. So that makes them not particularly likely to fossilize. And because they're tiny and break down, even if they do fossilize, they're not particularly likely to be found. Many fossil sites have insects and they just People working there either don't have the resources to sample for tiny insect remains or might overlook them. They might be hard to recognize. So there's a lot going against finding insects in the fossil record. Yeah, if you just happen, if you just don't happen to put your findings under a microscope, then you just may never find them. Right. And insects are found in fossils all over the planet. Super abundant in fossil records. Because... Every continent has fossil insects. Even when you're bad at fossilizing, when you're as numerous as insects... When you are everywhere, (laughs) you're gonna get caught anyway. We have people everywhere. Insects are found as uh, fragmentary remains. So at the Gray Fossil Site, we've identified insects from remains of, of like, beetle... Carapace. Caria cuticle, elytra, I believe, typically. You can also find insects as compressions in rocks, like leaf imprint style, uh, which we've also seen at the Gray Fossil Site. You can get 3D replacement, so you actually have the full body silicified or pyritized, where you can get the whole picture. Famously, you can, of course, get insects preserved in amber, although that only happens at specific places and specific times, Mm -hmm. where amber is particularly prevalent. Episode 62 for more on that. And then other things like opal. I don't know. I did a a very brief Googling for uh, examples of insects frozen in ice. Oh, yeah. I didn't find any examples, 
but I'm going to go ahead and say we have found insects frozen in ice. <laughs> right. Because we must have found insects frozen in ice. Because there actually are ice insects. Right. There are insects who live in ice. And there are insects who freeze themselves. Yep. The weta is a type of cricket. That freezes over the winter like a wood frog. Yep. So, yeah, we, we found living insects frozen in ice. <laughs> and then the other thing, the other way that insects leave their mark in the fossil record is by leaving their mark in the fossil record yeah. as trace fossils. We get burrows and nests and larval cases. Uh, you can get galls, uh, which are like the little tumor looking things that you see on sticks sometimes. Uh, we found those at Gray. Mm -hmm, uh, we've, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen at least one very thin twig that had a little gall in it. When insects lay their eggs in certain plants, it creates this growth around it because yeah. it's got something in the plant that it shouldn't be there. Right, it's an infection. And that's a sign that a baby insect <laughs> grew yeah. in that plant. You can also get feeding damage on plants. Chewing. So, chewing on leaves, boring through wood, things like that. So there are tons of ways we find evidence of insects in the fossil record. They are abundant today. They are abundant in fossils. They are just, they are ubiquitous. Well, it's, I think of insects kind of like, I had a friend who uh, was, was a big time botanist, you know, plant person. And one of their main complaints is how plants so often are just the backdrop. You know, we see them as the background. It's, right. And this know, is Allie's complaint as exactly. well. Yeah. Plants it's, are scenery when you paint a picture the picture isn't of the grass you paint the grass and then you paint the things that the picture's of on top of it right you know that it's a background i feel similar about insects very often to where it's just like you know here's the forest there's the chipmunks and the birds and the fox and then just bugs everywhere yeah, and there's some bugs and like but they are such a part of every ecosystem and they yeah can't help but just leave their marks or be preserved because they're everywhere. Yep. We find them inside other animals. Yeah. Because that's the other ecological importance of insects is that they form the basis of a lot of food webs. Yeah. It's they, they're they the the grass Na of the animal. Yeah. They are <laughs> nature's trail mix. Yes. Yes. It's like, yeah. That's what you're going to eat. Not too bad. No, they're not. I've had a few. Yeah. Now, this is true mostly. Yep. But of course, there was a time where insects weren't super abundant. There was a time before insects. So let's take a journey back in time and start our, our exploration of insect evolution. Because in the early days, before they were abundant, all those issues with finding insects actually become a real big problem. Mm -hmm. Like so many groups, early insect evolution and origins are a real big mystery. Now, let's place insects in the family tree of life. Insects are arthropods, and arthropods include a handful of major groups. You've got your morellomorphs, which are extinct an extinct group uh, called lace crabs. Oh. From back in the Paleozoic. That sounds cool. You've got your arachnomorphs. Hey. Trilobites, arachnids, which is spiders, scorpions, mites, and so on, plus other arachnid relatives. And you've got your crustaceomorphs, which are your crustaceans, uh, your sea scorpions, so your your, your your ripterids, myriapods, which are your millipedes, centipede type things, mm -hmm. all their relatives, plus hexapods. Yeah. Right? We've got tetrapods from episode 77, us four-legged things. We have octopodes. Yeah. Back in episode 16, eight-legged insects belong to hexapods yeah six legs but they're not the only hexapods so the the group hexapod also includes a few groups that have over time at times been considered insects mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but now i believe the latest thinking is that they are not actually insects but close relatives to insects which includes springtails oh so okay. columbolins which are the ones with the the their abdomen curves, the last section, I believe, curves under the body, and they can flick. Yeah, it literally has, like, a little kickstand that launches them. Along with the protura, who are called coneheads, and the diplura, which are called the two-pronged bristletails. All of these are very small, like, millimeters in length, segmented, uh, insect-like. I believe the main way they're differentiated from insects is with their jaw morphology. 
Oh, right. They have these sort of protruding jaws that separate them from what is nowadays considered true insects. And then the rest of hexapods are your true insects. We discussed a whole lot of different types of insects, different variations in insects, but the most basal insects, which is to say the group that branches off earliest in the insect family tree, the group that is perhaps most indicative of certain early features, are the the two groups known as Archaeognatha, which are jumping bristletails, and Zygentoma, Silverfish. Yay. I love silverfish. Silverfish. Yeah, and these are both, they are small, they're wingless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have tapering bodies. They are scavenging. Typically, they're they're eating detritus and stuff like that. They are fairly different from all the other insects, right? Their mouth parts are a bit different. They don't have wings. Mm -hmm. These are also the style of animals that we find in the oldest records of insects yeah so they they seem to have a comparable body plan yes an ancestral body yes so they may kind of resemble what some of the earliest insects looked and maybe behaved like and indeed we do have a few tantalizing hints at early insect evolution from fossils estimates uh put insect origins in the silurian Right, so up up around 440 million years ago or so, possibly earlier, I found one, uh, I think it was a molecular estimate that put them all the way back in the Ordovician. Wow. So somewhere in that, this is a time period where things didn't live on land. Yes. In, insects are among the first organisms, animals, uh, including animals and plants, to move on to land. Some of the earliest fossils in the history of insects come from the Rhiney Chert, In Scotland, which is an early Devonian site around 400 million years old, there are two fossils that often get referenced from this site. The first is Rhyniella, which is a springtail. Nice. Right? Hexapod, close relative of insects. The other is called Rhyniognatha, which appears to be a true insect. It's not sure what kind of insect because it's only partial. I think uh, most of what's there is the mouth parts, which suggests it was a detritivore similar to those basal insects we see today. There's even hints that it might have been winged oh. already back then. In the late Devonian, there's a site in Belgium that provided, this was actually published just a few years ago, a 2D impression of the first complete late Devonian insect. So now we're at like 380 or so million years old, around the time that the first tetrapods are working on moving on to land. Yeah, the late comers. This Belgian fossil is Strudiella, which is very silverfish-like. It's interpreted as being terrestrial because it has legs that look like terrestrial legs. Its mouth parts suggest omnivory, eating basically whatever it could find. No wings, which means it's either basal insect without wings or a young... Yes. Like a nymph. Yet to metamorphose. That hadn't gotten its wings yet. And then there are other fragmentary remains from around the late Devonian that seem to suggest things that are near insects, things that are early insects, some that uh, have been identified as silverfish or bristletails. So the Devonian is where we're getting these tantalizing hints of the earliest insects, these small silverfish-like animals that are creeping and crawling around on land eating whatever they can find. They're not specialized feeders, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as you might expect, because there's not a lot to specialize on on the land. Which brings us to one of the big interesting questions, and something that was actually requested for this episode, what it took insects to get onto land. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just briefly go over this, because we really don't have a lot of information on this. But insects, alongside a millipede-like things and alongside early vascular plants, are some of the earliest, at least eukaryotic organisms, to move to land. They are some of the first animals to undergo terrestrialization. (laughs) Cool word. And this seems to have been helped along by a few features that insects, myriapods, and arachnids, other early arachnids going up there, some of which were shared among different groups, some of which seem to have convergently evolved, 
early insects would have benefited from an exoskeleton, Mm -hmm. which not only provides structure, right, to support the body, but also protection. Yep. Protection, you know, we think of protection from, you know, predators and stuff, but an exoskeleton also is protective against things like UV. Yes. Sunlight. Insect exoskeletons have a waxy outer layer that helps prevent water from getting through. Which, when you're outside, losing water is a big problem. Yeah, as soon as you leave an aquatic lifestyle, now you're at a war (laughs) with the air that wants to suck all your water away. You're also having to breathe on land, and insects, along their body, they have these little holes called spiracles, which lead to tubes called tracheae, which have muscles that help them regulate gas exchange. This is their breathing system. They also have specialized tubules inside the abdomen that transfer waste outside. Reproduction has to change, and a lot of insects will use either spermatophores, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a little packet of sperm that you drop off and then a female picks it up, or they copulate. Yes. There are lots of insects that copulate, that internally fertilize a mate. Which has always stood out to me as kind of surprising, because so often we think of internal fertilization as the more, to use a poor word advanced or derived feature that it's like yeah you know well frogs don't do it and then reptiles start doing and then it gets fancy with other groups the 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 proper way to exactly mammals yes the cultured way right (laughs) but insects do it oh yeah all over the place like tons of groups of insects do it that way and that's it it's makes sense that's like of course they do yeah but it also kind of to me, puts it into perspective to where it's like, yeah, no, it's not actually as big a deal as it's often made. Yeah. It's the norm. So you have all of these traits, these features that are present in insects, are present in insect relatives. So not only the other hexapods, but myriapods have these, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which suggests that a lot of these traits probably predate insects. Yes. So insects themselves uh, may not have evolved out of the water their ancestors may have moved onto land and then insects developed from there. And what that leaves us with is these early creepy crawlies in a world with simple plants, simple land ecosystems, setting the stage for terrestrial life on the planet. And from there, after the Devonian, we start to see these major changes, these major steps in insect evolution. Now... There is so much to talk about here. (laughs) We are going to leave out most of it. (laughs) So what instead I'd like to do is pick a few major evolutionary innovations. The highlight reel. A few major trends that really sort of give you a sense of what insect evolution has been like. We're going to take a tour through insect evolution and make a few stops. Highlight reel is a good term for it. So as we move forward into the Carboniferous, as we're getting later than about 350 million years ago or so, we're going to take a look at some of the most important early innovations in insects after the break. Several major evolutionary steps, evolutionary innovations, changes, have really set the stage for insects to become insects as we know today. Arguably the first was their evolution on land. Yes. Right? Insects, as we mentioned, are terrestrial animals almost entirely. They dominate the planet, and the first part of that is moving onto the surface. However, insects not long after moving from the sea to the land, decided that they were yet unsatisfied (laughs) and made yet another change, becoming the first organisms to develop wings. Yeah, the first flyers. Way before, like well over a hundred million years before any other animal did this, insects evolved wings and powered flight. This evolutionary innovation is associated with the origins of a group of insects called pterygota. So you've got those silverfish, you've got those bristle tails, uh, which are wingless, and then you have pterygota, winged insects, which includes 
basically all the insects. Yeah. There are some that have lost their wings. There are some that have modified their wings. But this group goes on to be the insects. Yes. <laughs> this is basically it. There's a ton of discussion that happens around insect flight evolution. Yep. We talked about this in episode six, so we'll go over it briefly here, as with everything in this episode. It is estimated that insects may have evolved flight first, uh, possibly back in the Devonian. And we, like I mentioned, we see early insects that might hint at possibly being winged insects back then. But we definitely start seeing it in the Carboniferous period. Mm -hmm. The early definite winged insects belong to an extinct group called the Paleodictyoptera. The one that often comes up when I was looking at things is a genus called Delitzschala from the middle Carboniferous of Germany. So about 320 million years old. This is an animal that, you know, it's an insect. It's got wings fanning out to the sides, kind of like a dragonfly, with a wingspan of about two and a half centimeters, about All an right. inch, with colored spots. This group, the Paleodictyopterans, were actually very common and widespread. They are among the first groups of insects to achieve abundance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like you might expect from insects. They are widespread across the Carboniferous and the Permian. Some of them got real big, like the biggest ones had wingspans of over 20 inches. Wow. Over half a meter. <laughs> big bugs. They were beaked with piercing and sucking mouth parts, which at the time was a novelty. Huh. making them the first major group of terrestrial herbivores in a world where you couldn't have been a major group of terrestrial herbivores before this because there were not herbs to vor prior to this. Yep. They lived alongside other early insects, early relatives of mayflies and dragonflies, go back to the late Carboniferous, and then in the Permian period we see the earliest true mayflies and dragonflies. These were all also alongside a group called griffinflies. Yes. Which are relatives of dragonflies that show up in the late Carboniferous, make it to the end of the Permian. These are a lot like dragonflies. Big eyes, toothed mandibles, they have spiny legs, they were probably aerial predators. And famously, these include the largest insects of all time. Yay. Uh, notably, the one that often comes up is Mega Neuropsis. Uh, yes. There's also Mega Neura with wingspans up to 28 inches, 70 centimeters. That is a wingspan as long as my arm. Yeah. These were some of the earliest major predators. They were the earliest aerial predators. Flying around, probably eating other insects, possibly eating like Small vertebrates. Right? Yeah. Like in the Carboniferous. Something that's as long, with a wingspan, the length of an arm could absolutely be taking down small little, like if they were around a day, be taking down skinks and little things and yeah. gnolls. So insects develop wings by the Carboniferous and then take over. And it's really important to get, wrap your head around the fact that nothing had ever done that before. For over a hundred million years, Insects were the only flying things. The only thing in the air. Th that was it. There were no pterosaurs. There were no birds. There were no bats. There was nothing else. And so they absolutely dominated that sphere. They had to compete with each other. Yes, exactly. Because you couldn't get... <laughs> there was no one else doing it. Which is just incredible to think of. Like, as, as early as the late Paleozoic, insects were already taking on major roles as predators, herbivores, uh, in the air, on the ground. Really cool stuff. Which is something that's awesome about insects, is they are so ridiculously diverse that you could have an ecosystem of plants and insects, and it functions. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard, I read that, again, I can't remember where I read that while I was taking notes. But yeah, someone made that point where they're like, you could take all the vertebrates out and everything would be fine. Yep. Because insects and would, would basically do all the jobs. Yep. Which, humbling. And in fact, they did. Yes. Now, like I said, there have been lots of discussions about insect flight evolution, not only when it happened, but how and why it happened. Now, again, we'll talk briefly because we did this in episode six. We've mentioned it here and there. 
There are basically a couple of major hypotheses about where insect wings came from. One suggests that they originated from what are called paranotal lobes. So these are basically extensions of sections of the thorax. So flaps or like um, plates kind of coming off. I I, I think of it like when a a building has part of the roof. Yeah, an awning hanging off the side. That might have eventually developed into wings. And in fact, some of those paleodictyopterans from back in the early days, the earliest flying insects, have not only wings, but broad paranotal lobes with veins ah. like wings. Okay. So some have said, okay, that, that those could be it. The other major suggestion is that they originated from pleural appendages. So segments coming off the thorax. This is how gills mm-hmm. are thought to have originated. Uh, this is how legs potentially are thought to have originated. So wings could either have come from a, a set of gills or from something similar. This is supported uh, in part by genetic similarities. We had a, a news not too long ago that showed genetic similarities between gills and wings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then others have pointed out that wings are built like during development of wings, of multiple parts. Yes. So it could be some sort of fusion of these two different features. So we have a couple candidates for where wings came from, but the debate continues. More investigations of embryology and genetics and fossil record will help us to to better understand this. And of course, it's difficult because there's not a ton of fossils before this to help us figure it out yeah that when we it's it's a similar situation that we talked about with bats and pterosaurs for that matter but that when we get winged insects they're flying insects yes or so they seem to be so it, we don't get a lot of here are some winged insects that don't look like they could fly so we have that transition it, nope we have non-flying insects and then we have flying insects and so we're not we don't have a good record of that a rising of wings. We do have some hints uh, also as to why flight may have been Advent- favored, yeah. Yeah, advantageous selectionally. Uh, the big one that I, it seems to be a popular suggestion is that it started as parachuting. Yeah. Silverfish apparently do this. Silverfish will often have these wide paranotal lobes and they'll use them to control their falling oh. if they jump off of something. I didn't know that. So they'll kind of parachute or glide. And so it's been suggested that maybe early, all you need was some plants that grow high enough for an insect to jump off of them. Mm-hmm. Right? Early shrubs may have been the perches for insects to start parachuting. Which I love because when we think, when we humans think of parachute, we think of that as a way to save you from falling damage. Right. But if you're an insect, you can't fall fast enough typically to hurt yourself. No. For most insects, other than when you get to, like, the very big arthropods, does that become an issue? But for your small insects... Right. If you're a millimeter long... Yeah. Yeah, you're going to be fine. Air is too thick for you to hurt yourself while falling. So the parachuting is just control. Yeah. Where do I want to land? Where do I want to land? I want to land face up, please. So (laughs) that... You're right side up so that I'm not on my back all wiggling. Yeah. So it's... Maybe I want to land next to the puddle, not in the puddle. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a control thing, not a survival thing, which is fantastic. Yeah. So that could easily have, like has been suggested for basically all flying animals, parachuting to gliding to powered yeah. flight. Passive air movement to then powered air movement. Another suggestion, which I think seems to be less popular, is that flight may have started from skimming. Mm-hmm. So there are insects, I think mayfly nymphs do this, where their gills will catch the air and they'll kind of sail across the top of the oh, water. Interesting. That has been suggested, although it's been pointed out that skimming is not particularly popular, mm-hmm. and we don't have a lot of fossil evidence of early freshwater insects. So it's a possibility. There are multiple ways that, that you could end up with selection for flapping your lobes. Yeah, I've heard paddling suggested, mm-hmm. you know, if like that it was a swimming mechanism that then turned into a flapping mechanism. But once again, if we don't have aquatic, you know, if aquatic insects weren't particularly common, then maybe that's not as likely. And again, we don't have a ton of good fossil evidence to show us how it happened. So we have a bunch of good ideas Mm -hmm. that await more evidence. 
one way or another. They took to the air by the Carboniferous. They started to really become insects like we know them. And like I said, those early famous groups are similar to groups today like mayflies and like dragonflies. But not long after flight evolved, wings underwent another major innovation, developing into a condition that is known from a group of insects called Neoptera, Mm -hmm. as opposed to Paleoptera, which is the others. Like the Paleodictyopterans, dragonflies, mayflies, Neoptera is a group of insects that includes basically all the insects. Yes. (laughs) And what characterizes them in terms of their wings is that they have special muscles on their thorax that allow the wings to fold over the body. Mm -hmm. So if you think of dragonflies and mayflies, their wings are always out. Yes. Right. Even damselflies who can kind of move their wings back. Yeah. Instead of just holding them out, they fold up. Right. But your, your wings are still sticking up off your body. Yeah, you still always have them out like big sails. Right. The Neopteran insects inherited this ability to fold the wings back over the body. Like a cape. Like a cape, exactly. This is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Because this means your wings can be stowed away. It means that they're not just sticking out. You can sort of keep them close. It puts the wings in a great position to be useful for camouflage for protecting you. Grasshoppers use them for communication, for making noises. Well, it's if your wings are sticking out all the time, that really limits where you can go. Like now the underbrush, the underbrush is really not an option because if your delicate wings get damaged, well, you're not a dragonfly anymore. (laughs) So it, it, you can't risk it. But if you can fold them up nice and neat, now they're out of the way and you have tons of mobility options. Yep. And indeed, this is one of the features that seems to potentially be one of the winning conditions for beetles. Yes. Is that what beetles have done is they have transformed the front pair of wings into shields. Into armor into coverings. Armor. So they're, they're so if you think of a ladybug, mm-hmm. right, they pop open their back. And wings come out. Well, the flaps, the hood, are the forewings yes. that have been sclerotized, right? Made hard into like a shell. And the back pair of wings is what they're using to fly. And that this gets to another reason that insects are just one of the best things ever. Is they're robots. Yeah. Like. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're storing piece. They're hiding parts of themselves. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> you, you, all you need to do is watch a video of like a beetle taking flight. And then just add some and like some Iron Man noises. It fits so well, but they have these folding armor that protects the wings so that their wings can't be damaged no matter how rough and tumble they are. And then their wings and like they've studied this for for certain things like satellites that have folding solar panels and stuff. Their wings fold and scrunch in without wrinkling or breaking. Yeah. Under the covering and then unfold and it's all just hydraulics yeah and it's so amazing it is and and it allows you to go wherever you want you're always protected your wings are protected you can be a little sturdy turtle bug and it this is a bit and they're not the only ones there are lots of insects that have sort of leathery wings Mm -hmm. that are there for protection so this condition so so neopteran insects this folding wing ability first shows up in the Carboniferous. So way back then, and then we start to see modern groups showing up in the Permian. All right. And then eventually that trait ends up being inherited by almost all insects that we have today. In fact, I will read a quote from uh, the, the Grimaldi and Engel book. It is a remarkable quirk of nature that a few tiny muscles attached to a minute sclerite should be one of the main reasons for the great success of insects. Yeah. Yeah, A slight change to the muscles, you fold your wings, and now you're ready to be equally capable in land and air. Yeah, and that's really the thing that's so impressive, is it's like when you're watching the the mud-skipping fish that hop around on land, and you're like, wow, that's like, you're such a weird-looking fish, and it's crazy that you're like climbing a tree... And then they get in the water and then are just still a really good swimmer because they're a fish. Yeah. 
that's how insects feel to me is it's like I'm a grasshopper. I got these powerful, awesome legs. I can leap. I can climb around and like get to whatever I need to. Yeah, I'm real fast. And then when I choose to, I just take off like a bird <laughs> and fly cross country. Yeah. Because I'm an with, insect. With 15 million of my closest friends. Yep. And eat all the food. Like, <laughs> they are so versatile. Yeah. Not just as a group. It's not, you know, we were talking earlier about their diversity. That it's like, they've... One group or another has done these things, but as an individual, they are incredibly dynamic. Yeah. In their, in how they can survive moment to moment. And it's real impressive. Yeah. And, and their flight, this isn't just like, okay, you're technically in the air. Yeah. No. Insects are generally, right? It varies group to group. The best flyers. Yes. Insects are more maneuverable. They are. Uh, size for size, faster. They are agile. They have achieved flight to a degree that nothing else, no, none of the four groups of vertebrates that have taken to the air, including pterosaurs, birds, bats, and us with all of our technological mm-hmm. fanciness, are still looking at insects and going, how do you do that? Yes. Well, one of my favorite examples I ever heard, uh, and this may have been a TED Talk, but it was people researching house flies yep. in their flight and making the point that house flies are so agile at flight that they are able to make a pinpoint landing upside down yeah. on ceilings, which is like, you know, we think it's like, oh yeah, but of course flies do that. That's what flies do. But nothing else no, <laughs> <laughs> except insects can do that, like can fly up and then rotate and land upside down against gravity and just stand there and then just stay there. Like you were flying upside down for a little bit to land. Like you came in for a landing against gravity. Super acrobatic, super advanced flyers flight really right. They moved on to land and then they were on land and they evolved wings. And that really is possibly the thing. That characterizes insect diversity yes. is their ability to fly. The other major uh, evolutionary innovation that happens early on in insects and seems to be an important part of their later diversity is metamorphosis. Yay! Now, again, we'll do this. We'll, we'll talk about the details briefly because we had a whole episode about metamorphosis, episode 81. But as a refresher... There are three broad categories of metamorphosing in insects. Ametabolous insects don't metamorphose. Yeah, they start tiny, they get big. This is we see this in silverfish and other early uh, groups. Hemimetabolous insects or insects with incomplete metamorphosis mm-hmm. hatch as a nymph, uh, sometimes called a naiad. Yep, and then eventually become an adult by just by shedding their skin. So they don't actually go through a metamorphosis they just slowly grow babies different than the adult but not super different right they're molting uh throughout their life and then usually the final molt yep they come out and what really separates them is uh uh, oftentimes they have different lifestyles right dragonfly nymphs are aquatic and adults are terrestrial right they're flying around typically the two main things that differentiate the nymph from the adult are reproductive organs and wings. Yep, the babies can't reproduce, and they they may have wing nubs, but they don't have wings. Right, and then they shed. They have that final shed, and the wings come out, and now they can make babies. This we see in dragonflies, mayflies, uh, termites, roaches, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are what I always uh, think of. A bunch of groups do this. This seems to be associated with the origin of wings. Oh, it makes sense because that. Right. And, and it's, again, it's weird. Uh, Vertebrate flyers don't do this. Yes. You don't get wings until you're an adult. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, baby birds are born with wings and then they have to learn how to use them. Yeah. It's here. You go live the next, for some of them, couple of years of your life. And then when you hit your version of puberty, we're also going to expect you to learn and be able to fly. Yeah. (laughs) It's like your driver's license, except it's a pilot's license. (laughs) So wings are a major differentiator here. And then there is complete metamorphosis, holometabolous insects, which are what you think of as metamorphosis. Yeah. Baby you, and adult are 
unrecognizable. <laughs> you hatch as an egg, from an egg, into a larva, which is typically a slender, soft-bodied, gooey, short-legged thing with no wings. You eventually enter a pupa phase, where you are enclosed and transforming, and then you emerge as an adult. So, maggot, pupa, fly. Caterpillar, cocoon, moth or butterfly, caterpie, metapod, butterfree. Yep. This is your complete four stage, including the egg, metamorphosis. This innovation is associated with the origin of a group of insects called holometabola, which includes basically all of the insects. Yeah. <laughs> Something like 85% <laughs> of insects are holometabolous insects. In large part because this group includes the big four. Yes, it does. Flies, butterflies, wasps, and beetles are all holometabolous. They all have larval phases, pupa, and then adult. And for many of them, the pupa is just like the grasshopper, is just a final shed, really. It is their skin that forms their case. Right. They don't have the the chrysalis that you have in butterflies, which is a special shape, like... A pupating ant looks like an ant, and then it sheds out of that and is a an adult ant. Right. And like a lot of beetles, uh, there's one great video of a Hercules beetle metamorph- metamorphosing, and the pupa for it just looks like a crusty adult beetle, and its abdomen wiggles like it's actually able to move like the adult already. Uh, so yeah, for there's tons of variety in what the pupa are like, which is yeah. really cool. Now, there is... Again, the open question of how and why did this metamorphosis evolution happen? And again, we discussed this in episode 81, but a brief refresher. There are basically two schools of thought as to how you got complete metamorphosis from incomplete metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. Because incomplete metamorphosis is basically, you know... It's it's fancy growing up. Even ametabolous insects are still molting. Yes. You're molting, you're changing a little bit more as you go... And then when you reach an adult phase, you stop molting and you have wings and whatnot. The two major ideas of how you make the jump to holometaboly, one is that a larva, the, the, the grub, the maggot, the caterpillar, is basically the same thing as a nymph. Yes. Except that as evolution continued to differentiate adult from nymph, They eventually became so different that the last instar, right, the last stage between molts, became the pupa to bridge the gap. The other suggestion is that the larva is actually derived from a stage called Mm pronymph, which is right after hatching, before you become a nymph, a lot of insects will go through this grubby, soft stage which is sometimes lasts days, sometimes lasts hours, sometimes happens entirely inside the egg, Yep. where you're basically still an embryo, and maybe you're crawling around. Some have suggested that a larva is what happened is the pro-nymph stage became extended and expanded upon, and then the pupa is the intermediate that takes you from basically free-living embryo, that we have evolved into a caterpillar or something, to... Totally different adult. Yes. As for why, what are the benefits of this? Uh, It's been pointed out that obviously this allows you to differentiate what the babies are doing from what the adults are doing. Yeah. Extreme niche partitioning within your own species. Right. Adults are doing something totally different, so there's no competition. It's also, I read, uh, pointed out that this metamorphosis shortens the lifespan of the larva. Mm -hmm. So they're less likely to encounter predation or parasitism, which there are some larvae that live very short lives, but there's also some that live very long lives. Absolutely. So this is maybe a benefit. Yeah, because you said that and I was like, does it? Because like there are some that can be a larva for the better part or more of a year. Yeah. So it perhaps that's a benefit for certain groups. Maybe it was early on. Mm -hmm. This feature, this complete metamorphosis is present in the Carboniferous. Again, this is an early innovation in the evolution of insects. And then, with these major innovations in place, we start to see modern groups really diversifying in the Permian period. 
shortly before the one extinction event that actually hurt insects, <laughs> the End Permian, episode 45, after which we start to see insects modernizing. We start to see the development of groups and families of insects that we recognize. Yeah. At this point, I would like to now bring up another trend that really characterizes not, not, you know, all insect evolution, but especially as we get into the late Mesozoic and the early Cenozoic. And this is the trend of co-evolution. Yay! Co-evolution is when closely associated species impact each other's evolutions. Yes. Right, you're living close together, you're interacting, and so you're evolving kind of in tandem. Yeah, the 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 selection pressures are now coming from that other species right. in a very direct way. This happens all the time in lots of animals and plants. This happens a lot in insects. This has probably been happening with insects since they first evolved. <laughs> yeah. But the most famous co-evolution example, not just among insects, probably period, is Insect coevolution with angiosperms. Woo! Episode 57. During the Cretaceous, and especially toward the end of the Cretaceous, we see the arise and diversification of flowering plants. And today, insects and flowering plants are extremely tied together. Yeah, tightly, tightly linked. Insects pollinate about 85% of angiosperms. There are tons of flowers that have evolved to deal with insects that, that have mimicked the shape of insects or the shape of mushrooms or things that insects want to produce smells to attract insects, to have colorful patterns to attract insects. And likewise, there are insects, tons of them, that have specialized anatomy for dealing with flowers. Yes. There are insects with mouth parts, you know, sometimes really long proboscises to get the nectar inside flowers. Uh, there's the famous case of Darwin's hawk moth. Yeah. Where Darwin saw a star of Bethlehem orchid from Madagascar and said, surely there's an insect with a foot long proboscis <laughs> to drink that nectar. And then sure enough, there is. Uh, you also see, uh, and I didn't know this, Adaptations for hovering yeah. are common among flower-feeding insects because it lets you feed on lots of flowers without having to land. Yeah, that's also one of the things that's so cool about insect flight just in general is most flyers fly forward, period. Yep. They can't hover. They can't fly backwards. Insects, both of those other options, typically no big deal. Yeah. And hovering is real good for feeding in place and just popping from place to place. Hummingbirds do yeah. the same thing and they feed on flowers. And we also have the hummingbird moth. Yup. Which not only does the same thing, but in a very similar way to hummingbirds. Yeah. We see these associations today and at least as far back as the Cretaceous. We see insects with long proboscises, with wings that seem to be adapted for hovering, insects in amber and elsewhere with anatomy, anatomical parts for collecting pollen, yeah. right? Little baskets for pollen, stuff like that. And we see fossil flowers with uh, structures that seem to be for attracting insects. This association goes back to the Cretaceous. And this coevolution seems to be at least partially responsible for modern insect diversity. Mm-hmm. Modern insect groups start showing up really mostly in the Permian, but more familiar families show up in the Cretaceous and early Cenozoic during several major radiations of insects. Around the Cretaceous to the, to the early Cenozoic, so we're talking, you know, 100 million to 50 million years ago, we see the major diversifications of modern beetles and butterflies, which today are two of the largest lineages of not just plant eaters, but pollinators, uh, flowering plant-associated creatures. We also see major diversifications going into the early Cenozoic in the true bugs, yep. which are tightly associated with plants, and in the flies, which is the, the, the other of the, another of the big four. And we see major radiations in hymenopterans, Woo! including in the Cretaceous, the origins of ants and bees. Yay. 
and then big radiations slightly later on. This one-two punch of angiosperms and then associated diversification of insects makes the world what it is today. And this is something that I, that, that I think is really important to stress. We've been talking about a few of the major innovations, the major events, the major radiations and in insect evolution. And every time there is a major shift in insect evolution, it is not just a major change for insects. It is a major change for the planet Earth. Yeah, for the world. When insects evolved flight, the world changed. When insects started co-evolving with angiosperms, the world changed. These are hugely impactful groups of animals. Well, it's it's like I've said with other things of if an alien were looking at the planet, that this easily, if they were not an alien so biased to the macro, to the yep. large scale, is a planet of insects ruled by, run by, and controlled by yeah. insects. We are mere guests. Yes. And this co-evolution isn't just something that characterizes insect evolution with plants, mm -mm. but also with other animals. There are tons of examples of this, but my favorite one is co-speciation in lice. Yeah. So lice are a major group of insects, several thousand species, that are highly specialized for parasitism. Lice are possibly unique, or at least rare feature, that they spend their entire life cycle on one host. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are born there, they grow up there, they die there, and many lice species are restricted to one type of host. And so what we see is this co-speciation trend where if the host evolves, the parasites evolve. Yes. And there have been a bunch of studies that have shown this, so there are a few listed in my book, uh, a 1993 study on pocket gophers, a 1998 study on swiftlets, and a 2000 study on seabirds that each did phylogenetic studies on the evolutionary history of the major, the big animals, and the lice that live on them, and found that their cladograms, their evolutionary trees, match up. Which is, which is great. When the hosts speciate, the parasite species, the lice would speciate. Which makes complete sense because for us big animals, when the environment changes, that's when we see shifts in speciation and in populations. Yeah. When your environment's a person, then when it shifts, so do you. And it just so happens that some of the best animals to parasitize, if you are a louse or similar animal, are endotherms. With fuzzy coverings. <laughs> yeah. Which, as we move into the late Cretaceous into the Cenozoic, are on the rise. Yes. So as birds and mammals become more and more popular, so too do the insects that parasitize and feed on them. Lice, flies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's tons of blood-sucking insects. There's also a whole bunch of flies that lay their young in hosts. Like bot flies. Yeah. Yep. Oh. So we see insect radiations, their evolution, following the trends in animals. And we also see other animals co-evolving with insects. So, again, tons of examples, but my favorite one is animals like anteaters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An anteater has digging front limbs, a tube-shaped face, and a long, sticky tongue, specifically... For feeding on ants and termites. Yep. And those features have evolved at least five or so times in mammals. Anteaters, pangolins, numbats, echidnas, aardvarks. Th that, is a f that is a whole body shape and lifestyle that revolves entirely around specific groups of insects. Yes. Eating one, not just insects, but one kind or a couple kinds of insects. Insect. Insects are directly responsible for the radiations of a few major groups of mammals who specialize to feed on them. So so be thankful. Ants gave us pangolins. They gave us pangolins. You know what else insects arguably gave us? What? Bats. Yeah. Microchiropteran bats, episode 59. Check it out for more details. 
are highly specialized. Insect feeders, there's all sorts of cool examples of evolutionary battle between insects and bats adapting to feed on or avoid each other. Like noise cancellation and all sorts of stuff. Yup. Bats are also apparently hosts to tons of insect parasites. Huh. So they are, not only are they evolving in tandem with insects in a predator-prey relationship, but also in a host-parasite relationship. Who feeds on who? (laughs) (laughs) So mammal evolution and plant evolution are partially shaped by insects. Insect evolution is shaped by these other things. They are so tightly tied into the other life on the planet. This co-evolution, this interaction, this dramatic impact on other life is a intrinsic part of insect history. And I have to mention my two favorite examples of co-evolution with insects. Absolutely. Are the farming ants. Yep. Where there's multiple versions of these, but the two common ones is you have the cattle farming ants, which take care of aphids. Yep. That feed on plants, suck out the juices of the plants, and then create honeydew, which is sugary excess poo that then the ants drink. And they protect the aphids. They move them to grazing grounds. And that, like there are species of aphids that are the ant aphids. Yep. And then the leaf cutter ants, harvest and grass cutting ants, will harvest vegetation, take it back to their nest, and then grow food fungus on it and that's what they eat and the fungus found in these ant nests are only found in these ant nests nowhere else in the world will you find this fungus they created species of fungus yes and then have nurtured it over millions of years and that's insane like we talk about uh, some animals get called environment architects like beavers and stuff that elephants elephants that reshape their environment these are very small environments but like this is an environment that exists nowhere else on the planet except within the home of these ants yeah and that's so incredible i love it and speaking of ants one other thing i wanted to mention briefly because i know you would like it is what we know which is not very brief yep about eusociality. Yeah, how did they become eusocial? So, as I mentioned, uh, there are different types of sociality in insects. Eusocial insects are the ones who, they have colonies, they have a queen, they have workers helping the queen, taking care of uh, of the young, the larva, the, the eggs. It's very often compared to human civilizations in cities. That yes. We're one of the only other animals to have evolved eusociality. Often we think about this in ants and bees but eusociality has apparently evolved over 20 times. Wow, that's more than I thought. In insects. There are eus- eusociality is seen in thrips, in aphids, in certain Australian weevils, mm-hmm. which are fungal farmers. Ooh, oh wow. A number of wasps and bee groups. And then, of course, ants and termites. Mm-hmm. There are other eusocial animals. Yeah, I, I know cockroaches. There are some that have nests. Uh, there are certain spiders. Right. Uh, there are snapping shrimp. And then, of course, there's naked mole rats. Yeah. But that's another episode. <laughs> now, uh, an interesting feature of the evolution of this, and we won't go into the details of how this evolved because that's another episode. Like I said, we're leaving out most of insects. Yep. But when is interesting. Bees and wasps appear to have evolved eusociality and lost it multiple times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you get your bee colonies, but... Ants and termites appear to be ancestrally eusocial. <gasps> That's awesome. At least according to the information in my book, the oldest known representatives of these groups are already eusocial. This happens back in the Cretaceous. In, in bees, wasps, ants, termites, we see signs of eusociality back to the Cretaceous. But with ants and termites, they're not particularly common animals yet. Oh. Already eusocial, but they don't diversify and radiate in a major way until the Eocene. And the groups that radiate out of that diversification seem to specifically be the ones that form massive colonies. Oh. So early on, it seems like ants and termites, their colonies may have been small. Yes. 
relatively small cost. They're still doing, you know, workers taking care of the queen type stuff, but it isn't until early Cenozoic that, you know, termite mound mm-hmm, type termites mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the leaf cutter type ants, those big deal colonies show up and then that is an innovation that is associated with a major radiation to ants and termites. And then also, th- you know, bees and wasps yes. like we see today. That's so fast. And it makes sense because like the big colonies is what we think of as the norm for ants and termites today. But there are like bullet ants are not individualistic, but they are fairly solitary. Like they don't go on big group raids single ants go off right and that's why their sting is so horrifying but it's interesting that eusociality was not the success plan right but the size of your community and that's something that we see across these trends right the evolution of wings wasn't necessarily instantly the driver of all this diversity there were several innovations in wings Mm -hmm. that each were majorly important metamorphosis right there are multiple developments of different styles that lead to this diversification it's not as simple as this feature a bajillion insects yeah exactly things keep getting refined over time and then this brings us to the last thing that i want to discuss there is a section at the end of the grimaldi and angle book that discusses why are insects so diverse yeah what, 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 what? Why aren't they being uh, actively competed against? Right. How diversity? did you do this? And they suggest a few major contributors. Number one, their bodies. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about this a bit. Insect bodies are extremely well designed. Yes. They're versatile. They can uh, go into all sorts of different habitats. They can fly. They can metamorphose. They have very efficient breathing for animals like that. They're able, because of the structure of their body, because of the segmentation of their body, there's a lot of potential for specialization of Mm -hmm. body parts. So their bodies allow for a lot of flexibility, a lot of diversification. Also, insects have high speciation rates. Yes. Obviously. Not only do they have quick generations, but they make tons of babies. Yeah, they... I they live and die quickly, so generations are short and fast, and each generation is bajillions. You know, it's thousands of eggs, so tons of material for natural selection to play with. But also, they tend to have low extinction rates. Mm-hmm. I mentioned this in passing, but most of the major mass extinctions in Earth history don't seem to have bothered insects all that much. For one reason or another, they're resilient enough that they just don't really seem to get hit hard during eco- ecological collapses. Which is, as we pointed out before, is another great example of the when we talk about extinctions, we're typically talking about the common popular groups that we like discussing. But from an insect perception, there's been a very different number right. <laughs> of big, massive, important extinctions. There's been one, maybe two. Yeah. And so... They are playing a different game. Yeah. And then the other thing, right, they have these great design. They evolve quickly. They go extinct relatively rarely. And then the other thing they have going for them is that they are 400 million years old. And that's something that really, I I feel like, gets overlooked so often. When when you talk about the bees versus ants and termites when it comes to eusociality, or bees and wasps, in that... Bees and wasps have lost it and evolved it multiple times, so it's a derived and lost trait. But ants and termites, it seems ancestral. And when you look at those two groups, bees all basically look the same in Mm -hmm. a colony. Ants have soldiers and workers, and the queen looks different. Like, they have specialized anatomy for the different roles. Yeah. Because it's they've that's what they've been doing the whole time. And so when your group's been around longer... You've had more time to hit upon all the ideal strategies. And insects have been around for all sorts of ecological shifts. They piggyback on other groups, Mm -hmm. right? That co-evolution with angiosperms, with mammals, which they've been doing about longer than vertebrates have been on land. Yes. 
all of this they've got going for them and just forever, for as long as anything has been on land, insects have been adapting and diversifying and evolving and reproducing. And so, yeah, it has left them in this incredible position where they are just built into terrestrial ecosystems. Yes. And it makes them a, it, it makes them fascinating. It makes them horribly intimidating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it means that an episode that attempts to capture the evolution of insects can only fall short. Yes. We have left out most of it. <laughs> there is so much to talk about. Every section of this episode could be expanded further. And as always, if you'd like it to be, if you want to hear more about, well, metamorphosis, we did that. Mm-hmm. And flight, we did that. Yep. Eusociality and yeah. coevolution and specific groups of insects... Because, I, mean, I mean, if someone were to request an ants episode, we'd have to do it. <laughs> there are entire groups of insects I just haven't mentioned in this episode. Oh, yeah. But the briefest mentions of, like, roaches and mantises mm-hmm. and grasshoppers, which are major groups. Like, uh, uh, lacewings, I don't think I even mentioned lacewings nope. in this episode. Cicadas. Cicadas, which are part of the, the true bugs, I believe. Yeah. Which is its own whole thing i think i said i think i said the word fleas once yep fleas and then completely left it like that i've always loved assassin bugs which use the same piercing mouth parts to pierce other insects so there's there's so much to to branch off of here so as always if there's more you'd like to hear if we left out your absolute favorite thing and you got to the episode and you went, what? But did, how what? could you not? How could you let us know what it was? What was the thing you were, you're annoyed at us for leaving yes. out of this episode? Cause we are too. Le- yeah, I sure. Listen, <laughs> if I, if I could just sit here and read this book to you, that would, we'd do that for a whole year. It's going to be me reading this book. So thank you to the people who requested this episode. Thank you to our new patrons and everyone. And before we wrap everything up, we have a patron question. Whee! Now, I have been talking a lot this episode. I've been talking about lots of things. It's been a lot. So I've selected a patron question for Will. Woo! This is a question from Serpentine, who asks, Why do crocodiles... And if I can just point out that this person goes by the moniker of Serpentine and asks a question about crocodiles. Just play in both sides. uh, Play in both sides of the game. It's it's a savvy question person. (laughs) (laughs) Why do crocodiles have those distinctive pits in their skulls? Are there other animals with similar features? And then they linked to a picture from Facebook of someone prepping uh, an Eocene croc skull. Nice. And yeah, what people, if you've ever seen a croc skull, if you haven't Google it, they've got all these pits and, and yeah, just like a gnarly. Yeah, like a golf ball or like old wood mm-hmm. all over their skull. Will, wh- what's the deal yeah. with croc pits? Why? So that texture, I've typically heard it described as rugosity, that mm-hmm. it's rugose, it's bumpy, it's knobbly. And this goes for the skull. It also goes for the osteoderms, the bones that underlie the skin of the back and tail and sometimes belly is often have the similar pits and bumps. And my general understanding is we don't fully know why. Uh, There's a couple of things that this could benefit for. For the osteoderms, they are very blood filled they have lots of blood vessels running around and through them because they play a part in thermoregulation for absorbing sunlight very efficiently like solar panels. And so they pump blood through them. So they're, the, the patterning and pitting could be very helpful for that. The one that I've seen as that was a study to try to determine a purpose for the face patterning was looking at the Textron alligator skull and face and seeing if it affected how they moved through the water. Hmm. Very much like a golf ball, if it reduced turbulence, if the water hugged them like the rough skin of a shark, letting them move through the water with less turbulence, with less motion detection available to their prey. And according to the tests they did, which were done, if I remember right, with a model, a 3D model of an alligator skull that they put on a robot arm and then swung through the water... (laughs) 
and fired lasers at it as it detected the particles in the water moving. Nice. They found that it indeed did seem to reduce the turbulence. And this was supported by videos of alligators snapping fish underwater. And that, according to their research and measurements, the attack on the alligator was slower than the reaction rate that they've measured of the fish. Hmm. Indicating that the fish didn't notice the attack until it was too late. So that patterning could very well be a way of stealth mode in the water for alligators and crocodiles. But as far as I've heard, we don't have a good, solid, agreed-upon answer for why it is so characteristic of crocs. Yeah, it's it's a it's a easily recognizable feature. Oh yes, like you you don't mistake a croc skull for much else. Yeah, they they are just knobbly, gnarly faces. It's a great question because it's one of those, it, it's one of the best kinds of questions. Where I've heard that question a, a thousand times. Oh, yes. Because you look at a croc skull and that's one of the first things many people yeah. think. It, they, you know, eventually you go, okay, yeah, but why? Why does it look like that? And we don't know. Mm-mm. We have some ideas. I always like to, dif- to distinguish between we don't know and we have no idea. Yes, exactly. Like, it's not that we have no idea. We have ideas. We have supported ideas. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's multiple factors. Maybe there's things we haven't thought of. It 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 very well could be one of those, especially because it's so ancient. Right? Oh, yes. Gators, Crocs, Gary, they all have it. Mm-hmm. It could very well be one of those things that developed for a purpose or a number of purposes and now is just part of them so deeply ingrained in their evolutionary history and their anatomy that it's difficult to pull out the feature and go, what is this for? Well, and uh, something that I'm now realizing that I I can't say for sure, just because I can't picture enough terrestrial croc skulls in my head, I don't know how common that rugosity is on terrestrial hmm. crocodilians. If it's, if it's the textures are similar or if they're a bit more smooth because they're not moving through the water. Right. Uh, I, I can't remember right off the top of my head. I'd have to do a Google search. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a great question. Absolutely. Thanks, Serpentine. Remind us of, you know, after this talk of the intimidating insects, the best animals. Right, right, right. Snakes on a good asking note. questions about crocs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Envy. Everybody uh, for joining us. Thanks to our requesters, to our patrons, to all of our listeners. As always, there will be a blog post. There will be links uh, to our newses. There will be links to places for more information. About insects, we're going to have pictures, we're going to have some of these terms we used uh, on there, so if you want to go into a deeper dive, that's the place to do it. Link to the blog post in the episode description. As I said before, send us your requests. What else do you want to hear? Take a listen to Spooky, which just wrapped Mm -hmm. up for October. Keep your ears out for upcoming things around episode 100 in the near future, both general listeners and patrons specifically. We're going to have our end of the year Q&A. Lots of exciting things coming up. We release episodes every fortnight for a hundred fortnights (laughs) so far. (laughs) Join us next time as we enter what may... A new era. As we explore the third digit. (laughs) (laughs) Bye, everybody. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.